Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 13th, 2015, and my guest is David Scarbeck of King's College London. He is the author of The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System. David, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks very much. So I want to warn listeners, this episode of Econ Talk may be a lot more disturbing than our usual fare. If you're listening with young children, you may want a preview before you share it with them. Uh, this has uh, – uh, I, I forget what the language is uh, in in the movie. I think it's a thematic – PG-13 for thematic material or something like that. Um, so I just wanted to let people know up front that that's, uh, there may be some disturbing uh, images or conversation here. Uh, this uh, is a really incredible book. I was utterly fascinated by it. I learned an immense amount, way too much actually, <laughs> um, about prisons Uh I say that with tongue in cheek. It's a, it's really a, you've done an incredible job, and it's a fabulous uh, application of economics to a uh, a wide range of of social phenomena. It's really an amazing book. You start with the assumption that people are self interested and rational, and I think uh, a lot of people are will are put off by that. And you try to explain why you think that's an important assumption. You'd think prisoners, by almost by definition to some people, are obviously irrational. Uh, they act impulsively and get themselves put in prison, uh, which probably was not their goal. So explain the – to start us off with why you want to treat them as rational and self-interested. Well, I think that you know the first reason that we might want to do that is because people who have been in prison um, say that prison is an incredibly strategic environment. It's an environment where people have to pay attention to how their behaviors are being perceived by other people. It's a situation where people are willing to act opportunistically, and one must protect himself from those actions. So the environment is very much, um, I guess, um, uh, set in a way in such that thinking that someone is going to be actively paying attention and trying to improve their situation isn't a, a big stretch of the imagination. A lot of the inmates uh, in my book do care very much about themselves, but they also care about some of the other people in their situation. So what's unique about the prison environment is that we can't just kind of assume good intentions and um, assuming that people are self-interested is kind of a nice analytical way to start. Yeah, it, it seems like a good starting place. Uh, you also start off uh, setting up the information that's to follow in the analysis by talking about the challenge of governance in a prison. And again, as somebody who didn't know as much about prisons, I, in my view, there's there's sort of two views of prisons. One is um, the uh, view that that some people have that they're just basically like country clubs where uh, people are have a great time, watch TV, play sports, lift weights, and um, take uh, correspondence courses. Uh, versus uh, the Wire, which is the uh, one of the greatest uh, TV shows I think ever, literally. And uh, the reality is, I think, much closer to the wire, the cases you're talking about. Uh, but for, if you don't know anything about it, if you don't know much about prisons, you'd say, well, what's the big deal about prison governance? you got guards. You have a warden. You have people in charge. Why would there be anything else needed? Yeah, and it, it's easy to, to think or to hope or maybe just assume that prison officials can provide a lot of governance. There's guards that are monitoring inmates' interactions with each other. When violence or fights break out, there are guards that are there that are going to try to stop that violence. Uh, so they're clearly providing some security and some safety. Uh, the structure of a prison provides some safety. So if you think, if you imagine yourself in a prison cell, the door that's keeping you locked in is also in many ways keeping other people locked out. So there's a lot of, I guess, security and built-in governance in prisons. But what we find when we study prisons you know, in really just about any setting, is that that formal governance is insufficient. Uh, it's insufficient to meet the, the demands for governance that inmates have. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. 
The first is that even when officials do much, even when they're effective at trying to make inmates feel safer, many inmates still feel vulnerable. They still feel like they're in an environment that's dangerous. And so on the margin, they want to spend some time and some energy to try to make themselves a little bit more safe, to provide some, some of their own governance. And another important reason why inmates require governance is because officials won't regulate the underground economy. And that's an important source of goods and services to many of the inmates um, in the prisons that I studied. Yeah, we're going to get to that underground economy in detail. But I want to start just with this basic question of security. Uh, you know, again, most of us, have our knowledge of prisons is from television. Sure, sometimes there's – somebody might get stabbed uh, in a – in a TV drama, but you figure, well, that's to keep the plot going, to keep the mm. the viewer interested. Um, it, it, it's hard to imagine that there's a lot of violence in a prison because, again, they're in they're in jail, they're in they're in cells, and and there's there's guards, and yet it's a very dangerous place. Why is it dangerous? Yeah, it's pr it's it's prone to danger. There are there are people. A much greater portion of that population have committed acts of violence in the past. Across the board, these are people who you know uh, test lowest on self control measures. It's a dangerous environment because it's a an environment that's characterized in many ways by extreme poverty and people most willing to use force to try to alleviate some of that poverty. So even though officials want to do a lot to keep people safe. Um, so, you know, the, the threat of danger is always there. Something that's very interesting about American prisons is that we think of them as being very dangerous, but compared to 30 or 40 years ago, they're much less dangerous uh, than ever before. So the, the rate of assaults, the rate of homicides fell 94% between 1973 and 2003, for, for instance. And when it, when it fell to t in 2003, that rate of homicides was actually lower than in the general population. So prisons are places that are much safer than they were previously, but even with those low levels of safety or of danger, uh, they, there's still always the potential for bad things to happen. But how is that possible? So, you know, I, again, in the movie version, I'm in my cell and, uh, of course, I have a roommate often, which is an issue. But at some point, uh, I go out into the yard and, and oh, there's a bunch of guards looking down on the yard. They've got rifles. <laughs> how does anything bad ever happen? Yeah, you know, for, for whatever reason, maybe because the prisons were built, uh, you know, too long ago or, or other architectural restrictions, there's always blind spots. There's always blind spots in the way that a building is set up. There's a limited number of guards to watch people in a cell at night. There's not someone who's monitoring each individual cell. So there's opportunities for bad things to happen, um, sometimes just because prisons are overcrowded. Um, when you look at the dormitories that um, California prisons uh, had for quite a while, um, these are going to hold 100, 200, maybe more men in a, in a place where guards are walking um, you know, between three bunk bunk beds, and it's very difficult to see what's going on two bunk beds over. It's a very loud environment, and um, you know, th there's simply not a panopticon uh, in many California prisons today. So there's the threat of something, something bad happening. What, a panopticon meaning? Uh, well, so, you know, a prison where, you know, a guard can see everybody's actions all the time or some, something along those lines. So it's possible that you can take revenge on somebody, beat somebody up, kill them. Um, and I have to say, reading your book, I had an ever-present sense of danger uh, as I was reading <laughs> it because besides the, act, the, the analysis, which deals with these issues, you have some very chilling and powerful anecdotes sprinkled uh, throughout that um, – talk about these kind of incidents that happen and they're not they're less common but the people are very vulnerable in a prison and that's that's a very important theme of your book so these blind spots are not like oh you know every three weeks you've got a chance to uh, let me say it differently people get killed in prisons because the murderers can kill them and it's not – yeah. that, that's the important part I want to establish. For, for, as a, Again, going into this, I thought, oh, the, the, how, that, you know, it must be – you know, some guy goes crazy and he kills somebody. But there are premeditated murders uh, because they can do it. Yeah, uh, th there's absolutely the threat of these things happening um, every single day. There are opportunities where people are potentially uh, subject to serious acts of violence by other inmates. There's, these aren't a total institution such that officials have complete control over everything that happens. There's actually 
uh, huge arenas of autonomy within this, you know, kind of apparently very controlled environment. So let's talk about gangs, and I think of gangs as something on the street, and yet uh, your book taught me that they're va- they're very they're dominating in the social environment of a prison today, and their reach extends outside the prison. So we could we're going to talk about this, you know, the whole time pretty much. Uh, so let's start though with uh, why are there gangs in prisons? What's going? Is it just for cultural identification? No, the main reason why gangs form in California initially is because inmates want safety. So because they're in this dangerous environment, they form, they join with other people, and those are people that they feel can keep them safe in that dangerous environment. Um, gangs haven't always existed in California for the first hundred years of the prison system. There were no, no prison gangs, um, but in the 1950s, they started to form, and they formed because um, the the level of security that officials provided uh, just simply wasn't enough for, for what they wanted. And why was that? Well, uh, the main reason why inmates turned to gangs is because prior to the period of gangs, inmate populations in California were very low. The total size of the inmate population in California for a century was fewer than 5,000 inmates. There was some growth. It was slow and steady growth during that period. But starting in the late 1950s and through to 1970, there's about a five-fold increase in the size of the prison population, about a five-fold increase that leads to a height that's unprecedented, a more rapid increase than ever before, a more sustained period than ever before. And in big prison populations, the sort of what, you know, what the book refers to as decentralized governance mechanisms can't work. So the world that inmates live in, the way that they protect themselves – looks radically different depending on whether the prison population is small or large. And in large prison populations, inmates form gangs for safety. So you started, I, you know, I guess it's a question of how you define decentralized, and we'll come back to that. But you start with how uh, in the earlier days of prisons, there was a code, a de- totally decentralized, a, a norm, a set of norms that emerged that prisoners uh, adapted, a- adapted to. And uh, it, it just became the culture of the prison. Talk a little bit about the code and uh, why and how the gangs replaced that code. Yeah. So when scholars have studied this, when uh, we have uh, histories and reports of people in prison at this time, what's emerged is that there was this norm of good behavior that inmates were kind of expected to follow along with. It wasn't a norm that you know inmates kind of all sat around and agreed on. It's something that emerged through their interactions with other people. And the, this code is sometimes called the, the convict code or the prisoner code, basically kind of told you how to live your life when you're in prison, when interacting with other inmates. It would tell you, don't steal from people, don't lie to people, don't inform on people. If you incur debts, pay those debts back. Kind of ways in which if you acted that way while you're in prison, other inmates would respect you. Because in acting in those ways, you wouldn't be causing conflict with other inmates. So if inmates like you, if they respected you, if you were in good standing, then other inmates would be much more happy to give you um, access to their resources, the support that you might need uh, to protect yourself from victimization. And sort of abiding by that code would provide a way to limit the victimization that you might face in that environment. So following the code is a way to be safe, and it was enforced in a very decentralized fashion. So for those inmates who consistently lied, stole, didn't pay back debts, these were people who caused trouble, right? It, it causes conflict with other inmates when an individual acts in these ways. So those people would be much more likely to be victimized by other inmates. Their low standing would mean that they couldn't have the support and the protection that their peers provided. So during this period, this norm-based governance or decentralized-based governance, there wasn't someone in charge. There weren't even many inmate leaders in charge during this period. People could either uh, abide by the code or not. And other inmates could either punish deviations from the code or not. And the way that they'd punish those, um, again, it wasn't very structured. It wasn't very systematized or organized uh, like it is today. It was basically up to the discretion of other inmates. And they could decide to ostracize people, say that you you can't spend time with us. We're not going to share cigarettes with you. They could gossip about people, which would, as a result, make the person who's being gossiped about be much more likely to be victimized because it would send a signal that he didn't have the support of other inmates. And, um, of course, you know, the, the, the norms could be enforced with violence, right? Anything from a slap or a punch up to uh, a very serious or, or even deadly assault. 
So prior to the formation of gangs, this convict code is the main way that order was established. It was the main way that property rights were defined and enforced. And in the underground economy, it was the main way that um, conflicts were, first of all, avoided, but second of all, resolved uh, when they did take place. And talk about why that broke down again and how what gangs replaced that with. Yeah, well, I mean, what we see, I mean, in studies of, of norm following behavior all over the place is that in small environments, it's relatively more effective, right? If we have a small homogenous environment, we all agree what the acceptable behavior is, what constitutes a deviation from that behavior, and what the appropriate punishment is given that deviation. And in small prison environments, we all agree on those things. And my standing, my reputation for following the norms or not is communicated to other people uh, in relatively easily. In small communities, my reputation is known by many or maybe even every other inmate in that community. Big prison populations undermine the effectiveness of norms because in bigger populations, it's much more difficult to keep track of everybody's behavior. It's more difficult to keep track of um, everyone's relative standing in the community, to know how they've acted in the past, and it's more difficult to know who else has um, taken it upon themselves to enforce the norms. So starting in the late 1950s and through the 60s, 70s, and certainly later on to today, we see dramatic increases in the size of the prison population, which undermines the effectiveness uh, of these norms. We also see a much more diverse community of younger inmates, and both of those things tend to undermine norms. Young people like to experiment with violations of norms, right? They want to see if there's some other norm that they should be following. So they're much more likely to, to break the norms that other inmates agreed on. And in more diverse communities, there's more disagreement about what accepted behavior is and what constitutes a violation of those behaviors. So as inmate demographics changed, it undermined the ability for this decentralized governance to maintain an orderly prison environment. And the other part that you emphasize, uh, which we, we should turn to now, is uh, there's a lot of money at stake, which is again, just shocking. Uh, there's a lot of money at stake in the underground economy within a prison, and as a result, there's an enormous financial incentive for some people who are profiting from that to maintain order because a breakdown in order ruins that economy. So explain why that is and uh, – Again, I, it's hard for me to understand. How could there be an underground economy? Where do they get money from? What are they selling and buying? But uh, it's very active. Yeah. So describe but, 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 it. You know, the, the nature of prison is rules and rules that prohibit things that inmates want. And there's a large number of goods and services that inmates would like to and enjoy but aren't allowed to. And, and these may be very mundane things, certain meals, certain magazines, certain books that officials don't allow them to have, where they can have a more illicit nature, right? For many inmates, the desire to use drugs and alcohol, to smoke tobacco in prison, they'd very much enjoy being able to do these things, but prisons don't let them do that. So if inmates want to ease the pains of imprisonment by gaining access to this contraband, they basically have to rely on the underground economy to do it. You can't buy heroin from the prison commissary, right? So. In order to gain those things, inmates have to find a way uh, to traffic them into the facility. And with, for those inmates who can do that, this can generate substantial profits. Um, the underground economy in prisons in California is not as uh, flourishing as it is out, out on the streets. So the price of drugs in prison is typically four to five times higher uh, than out on the streets. Um, but a large number of inmates want those things. And if you can supply them, um, it, it's difficult to measure, of course. Uh, but it, it appears to create some substantial profit opportunities for entrepreneurial inmates. Where do they get the money from? Well, it, it, money used to be allowed in some prisons. Recently in California, money is not – inmates aren't allowed to hold uh, money while they're incarcerated. But it turns out that paying for things in the underground economy is uh, n not so difficult. It's not so difficult to, uh, to arrange for. You may be able to um, barter with some goods that you have. In California today – Stamps are the medium of exchange, right? They're uniform, durable, transportable, uh, standardized commodity, and inmates will uh, purchase illicit goods uh, through the use of stamps. And for larger purchases, ones that books of stamps won't cover, um, it's actually relatively easy to just have a friend uh, or a family member on the outside 
send currency to a friend or a family member of another inmate uh, on the outside. And so you, your, your, your relative who's not incarcerated can make the payment, and on the inside you get, get receipt of the goods. Then the next question is, uh, how do drugs get into, into prison? Uh, it seems, again, impossible. I'm going to stop saying it, it, again <laughs> soon, but again, the, the, this book this book is full of surprises for me. I'm, I'm it's uh, it's it's very informative. Yeah. Well, so you'd to think give how, some sen- and how to much? give some sense about just how much drugs can get into a prison in California in 2013, uh, according to a report by the California Legislative Analyst Office, there was a random sample of inmates in California, and 23 percent of those. Uh, tested positive for drugs that they weren't allowed to have, and another 30% refused the test altogether, all right, presumably because they knew what the test result was going to say. So anywhere from 23 to more than 50% of inmates randomly selected have controlled substances um, in their system. So the access to these things, it, 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 it certainly, they're certainly getting in there. And the way that inmates get them in are varied. They're sometimes very, very creative. Um, and it depends on the particular situation. Sometimes staff members can be bribed to bring in drugs. Very often, inmates will transfer drugs, um, will receive drugs from visitors during the visiting facility. And they'll find kind of covert ways to transfer a bundle of heroin, for example, from a friend or a relative who's visiting him in prison into uh, maybe through a kiss, and he'll, he'll smuggle the drugs back into the, the prison itself. So, I mean, any of these ways of, of corrupting staff, um, convincing um, visitors to bring drugs in to something as simple as it, people will go by and throw drugs over the prison wall and an individual will, will know that it's coming and, and go out there and collect it. And that person it, something, that person's been in prison, is familiar with the layout, knows where to throw it, et cetera, right? It, yeah, maybe familiar with the layout. For inmates who have a, a lower security level who go out and do work during the day, someone might leave a bag, a, a McDonald's bag that has a burger and tobacco and heroin in it. And so if that worker knows where to look, he can find it, pick it up, and you know, s- smuggle it in in his pants back into the prison. So there's many, many ways that inmates get around this problem. And for people who have a strong desire to overcome this problem – uh, it's apparently, you know, e- easy enough that that they had get access to these things. And how did the prison gangs let's move to their governance? Um, There's some extraordinary. They don't just have informal rules. They have a lot of informal rules. They have formal mm-hmm. rules. They have written constitutions. Uh, talk about how gangs regulate life in the prison and how they compete with each other. Yeah. So I described the gangs in California's day as operating in a community responsibility system. And the distinguishing characteristic of the system is that everybody within a gang is responsible for each of the other gang members' actions and obligations. So if you're in a gang and you incur a debt, it's not just you who owes that debt. It's every other one of your gang members who owes that debt. And this extends not just to debts but to behaviors. If one of your gang members is insulting members of another group, is acting disruptively, is keeping people up at night. It's not just you. It's not just that individual who is going to kind of have a diminished reputation and kind of be pressed to fix that. Everyone in your group is responsible for that. And so it, not everyone affiliates with a gang in California prisons. It may be a broader group affiliated with kind of a racial or ethnic background. It may be affiliated with a religious tie or an educational emphasis for certain inmates. But the key actors in governing California prisons are groups, and gangs are an important type of group. So when the community responsibility system works, basically interactions between different gangs um, are regulated by tremendous pressure within the gang. And so maybe another way to to say that is that when a member of a gang is causing some – is involved in some sort of social or economic conflict with another gang – it's the gang leaders that get together from these rival groups. They discuss the situation and they say, you know, what, what are the facts? What's gone on? Who's disrespected who? And how can we resolve it? And those gang leaders then go back to their own groups and they exert tremendous pressure to gain compliance from the individual that caused some trouble. So if a, if a member of one prison gang is insulting someone, he may be forced to apologize by his own members uh, to the person who he was insulting. So there's cr- tremendous internal group pressure to facilitate inter 
group uh, cooperation. And the types of uh, pressure that they can apply, I, I guess, takes a lot of different forms. Um, it, it, debt, debt problems in the underground economy are, are some of the most problematic and, and uh, fairly common. And so if an individual in a gang incurs a debt that he can't pay back, it may be that his gang forces him to have friends and family pay it back. The, the gang may um, pool its resources, uh, its own resources, to pay off the debt for that individual. Um, the, the individual who incurred the debt may have to work it off for the other gang. If he owes uh, a debt to another gang, he may have to assault one of their enemies, maybe a guard who they don't like or, or another inmate, and work off that debt. Or it may be what's um, unfortunately somewhat common in California that when an individual in a gang can't pay a debt back, his own gang will assault him to the satisfaction of the rival gang leader, to the satisfaction that he's been assaulted to the extent that the message has been sent. So in, in a lot of these different ways, some just from apologies to, to assaults, these gangs are regulating their own members um, to make life a little bit easier when interacting with other people. And the gangs are uh, racially divided is one way they're divided, correct? <clears throat> they're overwhelmingly racially divided. And um, the, the, the inmates themselves refer to um, not, not just the gang actors, but the race actors, right? Everything is segregated along racial lines. And the groups themselves are segregated at least along racial lines. Sometimes geographic factors matter. So in California, for example, um, Hispanic inmates will affiliate with one or another prison group uh, based on whether they're from Northern or Southern California. Uh, this um, group resp community responsibility uh, is, is a fascinating example of dealing with a free rider problem. It reminds me of a story that I'm told that when Walter Williams teaches at George Mason, he uh, tells students that if your cell phone goes off, uh, the people on both sides of you will get a uh, reduction in their grade, a certain, lose a certain number of points. And when I tell that to people, they always say, well, that's so unfair. Yes, it is. Uh, and what it means is that the people on each side around you are going to tell you, people are going to tell each other, is your, ask, is your cell phone off? And in the <laughs> ideal system, the phone never goes off. There's never anything unfair because the punishment uh, deters people from uh, misbehavior and, and free riding on the group's uh, uh, identity and, and degrading the group's brand name. And so that's yeah. just an incredible um, – the, the prison just – when you have violence as opposed to losing five points on your homework score, it, it's, uh, it's pretty effective. But one thing yeah. I noticed that runs through your book is the power of disrespect – uh, I, I couldn't help but notice how often uh, horrific things happen to people because somebody said something, said something disrespectful, not did anything disrespectful, said something, or if they spat. Um, that, and I, I, I'm just curious, this is an aside, but I just thought in a place where you have so little pride, um, yeah, disrespect must be very uh, – respect is very valuable. So uh, disrespect is very, um, is very hated, I would guess. I think that's definitely uh, an important part of it. A another part of it is that if you're disrespected in a public way, other people see that and they think that you're someone who can be victimized and taken advantage of. So it's not just a matter of this guy insulted me or spit in my direction. It's that other people saw him that do that, and that puts me in a much more dangerous situation. So it's important that any little disrespect is responded to. So that when people are looking around for someone to steal or uh, to kind of get, get into trouble with, that they don't come looking for you uh, about it. So just to get some numbers on the table, uh, you say in your book that about 70 percent of prison gang members are in California and Texas. And you've talked a lot about California so far because I assume that's where a lot of gangs are. And we have lots of uh, – not lots, but all different kinds of information about their activities. Yeah. Well, part of the book, uh, you know, in, in a sense, the core of the book is to try to explain why prison gangs exist when and where they do. So California had prisons for 100 years with no prison gangs. Now prison gangs are very important. Um, there are prison gangs that have a very important influence in California and in Texas, but not in many other states. And so the goal is to try to understand why that's the case. And I guess maybe something that I didn't make clear in the earlier discussion is that these community responsibility systems aren't just uh, accidental. It's not an accident that they operate in this way. What it does is it puts the responsibility of monitoring inmates uh, 
in the hands of those people who have low cost ways of, of doing so, of monitoring people. It's very easy to, to look within your group and to watch your own members. In big prison populations, you can't watch everybody, so the gangs just force you to watch yourself. So you know, a community responsibility system facilitates interactions with strangers because you don't have to know every person's reputation, you just have to know the gang's reputation. And is this a gang whose reputation is in good standing because they're accountable for their members' actions or not? So it's leveraging, uh, it, it's a way, it, it's a very effective, brutal but effective way for people to govern relations in large populations. And that's why, for example, we see them playing a very important role in, in California and Texas. And it also uh, helps, as you point out, uh, explain why race and tattoos are uh, important uh, ways that gangs uh, identify. Yeah, there's no doubt that there are some, uh, maybe many, racist prison gang members. But there's lots of people who will, are, when they're incarcerated, they say things like, I'm not a racist, but I live in a racist environment. I live in a segregated environment, and I don't have a choice to not follow the segregated rules. And so, but there's a reason, I think, why segregation by race might actually help to govern or regulate social interactions. And it's that in these large environments, the easiest way to have some sense about who a stranger, who's, which group a stranger associates with, is the color of his skin. Right? If you can look and you'll have some sense and say, okay, I saw him, I don't know anything about him, but because I saw him, I have some sense about which group I need to go to complain about his behavior to. A second feature of, of using that, uh, the, the kind of a, a person's appearance in that way is that it's not easy to change uh, the color of your skin. Right? It's something that's very permanent. So in that way, you can't kind of bounce from group to group, keeping some people accountable at some times and other people accountable at others. So the, the kind of the durability of that aspect and the low cost of observing it make it um, much more than other possible ways, kind of a, a fine way, uh, an effective way to carve out groups amongst each other. So, so one comparison is that instead of breaking up groups based on racial lines, you could do it on religious lines. But it, it may not be as easy to look at someone and, and be able to tell if they're a Baptist or a Catholic as quickly or as easily as whether someone's white or black. And it's much easier to, to deceive and fake it and masquerade as a member of a group when when uh, when it's convenient. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and that relates to the the point you make about uh, the tattoos, right? As tattoos are just so prominent in many prison settings, and the reason for that, I argue, is because it, it's a very credible signal of information about who you affiliate with. Tattoos can provide information about. Uh, certain acts that you've done, certain things that are deemed to be good amongst inmates. And if you get one of these tattoos, because they're permanent and because they're prominent, it's very credible that um, kind of you are who you say you are through that tattoo. So let's talk about the uh, the actual rules that the that the gangs have. You've 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 implied there's there's rules of loyalty and certainly uh, and responsibility. You misbehave, you're subject to internal not external, external, not from another gang necessarily, not from the prison administrators, but from your own gang members. Sometimes uh, you're going to be punished. But what are some of the rules and, and how detailed are they to give people a feel for um, this world? Because it's very strange. Yeah, well, uh, many of the gangs have uh, fairly extensive um, paperwork uh, protocols, paperwork procedures. Um, Gang members write lots of letters, and the letters are sent to inmates at other prisons. They're sent out to people on the street. And the purpose of this paperwork is to collect information about people. When someone arrives at a cell block in California, very commonly, um, if, if a Hispanic inmate arrives, there's going to be a gang leader from the Hispanic gang, and it's going to be his job basically to send a questionnaire to the new inmate. Uh, one group calls these new arrival questionnaires. So when, when you first en enter into one of these cells, the gang leader is going to send you a paper, uh, a little paper questionnaire, and it's going to ask, who are you? What neighborhood are you from? What gangs are you associated with? What crime did you commit? And they're going to try to collect information and basically certify who you are. And they're going to match that with formal paperwork to make sure that uh, your name is the name that you say you are. So they'll, they'll, make, they'll make sure the name that you give the gang is the same one that you gave prison staff. And then they'll check that information as well against their own lists. 
So these gangs have sometimes very extensive lists. They're called enemies lists or, or bad news lists or uh, no good lists. These are lists of enemies, essentially. And so gangs are, are constantly using um, procedures and paperwork to get information about people to see if someone who needs to be punished should be punished when they show up at your prison. And people in, in, people in these groups are punished for a variety of different reasons. Uh, maybe because they haven't paid back a debt, maybe because they haven't paid uh, taxes to the gang members while they were on the street. Yeah, I'm going to read a quote here. I'm going to read two quotes. Uh, Without order, we have anarchy, and when we have anarchy, people die here. That's an inmate at Corcoran State Prison. Um, and here's a quote uh, that from you uh, in the book. The chief psychologist at the federal prison in Leavenworth describes the uniqueness of the environment. He explains when you are small and need help, you run to your parents. When you get older, you run to a priest, a minister, a psychologist. If you have a legal problem, you have an attorney. You hire an attorney. If someone threatens you, you call a cop. In prison, there is no one to turn to, no one to solve your problems for you. If you go to the guards, you'll be known as a snitch, and that can get you killed. So you are on your own, perhaps for the first time in your life, and you are forced to deal with your own problems. Uh, how does the gang uh, – help that new – the new inmate who is, let's say, clean, isn't a liar in debt, is who he says he is. Uh, how does the, the gang help uh, that inmate uh, thrive in prison? Yeah, the gang is someone to turn to. Um, w once an inmate's been cleared, they sometimes do background checks and letters uh, to friends on the street to kind of uh, confirm information that the new, the new inmate gives. Uh, but when that person is cleared, he, he joins the program or, or to, participates in the program, as they say. And that means that when somebody does cause trouble, when there is a conflict, he has someone to turn to, uh, the other members of his group. And that group, because their reputation is on the line, are going to take steps to make sure that if some, some, some wrong has been done, that it's going to be righted. So gangs are kind of a, a way to fill in for that vacuum of authority and stability uh, that, that, that the quote you uh, read indicates. But they're also a thriving business, some of them more than others. They're not just uh, – you make them sound like they're a social services group, but of course <laughs> they are to no, some no, extent. Of course if, but, you know, so th there's some mutual support, that's some mutual go. aid that, that's provided. And for inmates who go to prison – with a desire to have a very minimal affiliation with them, a minimal affiliation is sufficient. There, as long as there's some group that inmates can identify as being responsible for your actions, and that seems to be good enough most of the time. For those inmates who want to uh, kind of step up their game, who want to become more involved in these, these groups aren't just mutual aid organizations. They're groups that have sometimes very fearsome reputations, and those fearsome reputations allow them to bring valuable products into a dangerous environment and to sell them for substantial profit. Yeah, give us some numbers on the – obviously it's not uh, – this is not uh, easily collected from the U.S. Census or the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. But give us some idea of how much money uh, some inmates are making while they're in prison. Yeah, well, I mean, some of the and how, and how do we know? How do we know? Given that it's hard. Well, to get one way, one way we get information on this is to look at um, um, a government prosecution of prison gang members, and the state of California has very proactively um, prosecuted groups like the Mexican Mafia, prison gang, or the Nuestra Familia, and we have access to a lot of the the, the information that they collected. We also have access to appeals court rulings that examine the evidence and kind of confirm that their arguments and their information is, is credible. And what information like that says is that many of these inmates make tens of or hundreds of thousands of dollars every year while being incarcerated. They make that money from selling drugs in the prison. They make that money by, uh, they call them taxes, but collecting taxes or tribute from some inmates in the prison. If you want to sell drugs in prison, then you have to pay a certain portion to the, to the gang leader who's in charge in that area. And some of these people make uh, a tax on drugs that are sold out in the community, out in the street. Drug dealers out in the community will send a portion of their earnings to people who are locked up. So how do they – talk about how that communication takes place, how the um, gangs maintain incentives outside of prison. You know, somebody gets out of prison in, in, in some in – in theory, they're, they're out of prison. They're not in the gang anymore, you'd think. And they can go up and try to find a job. It's hard, but, but they don't – they're not allowed to leave the gang really, are they? Yeah. For the, for the most hardcore prison gang members, they're not allowed to leave the gang, and they sometimes have to actively work for the gang. You know, these people are very rational, and they anticipate the fact that 
you know, there's a very high likelihood that an individual who's released from prison is going to return to prison. And so they know that maybe the, maybe a prison gang can't hurt them when they've left, but at some point if they find themselves back in prison again, the prison gang might remember that and they might be able to hurt them. So because people anticipate incarceration in the future, prison gangs can wield that knowledge and say, you're going to work for us. You're going to send us money. And if you don't, when you come back, we're going to hurt you. You're not going to have the protection and the mutual aid. You're going to be, you're going to be hurt in a serious way. And they've invested through some very brutal acts of violence, uh, a willingness to do this. How is it that gangs can compete peacefully with each other within the prison? Uh, everybody wants money. Everybody would rather be the drug dealer. Uh, why aren't they um, killing each other for the opportunity to make those profits? And how do the different gangs deal with the fact that you know there's different uh, in, out, out in the in the on the streets there's territories that they fight over and they mm. skirmish over and, and you know they prefer to keep it peaceful obviously to make more money, but within that small world that that reduced physical space of the prison, don't they just uh, why aren't they fighting all the time? Yeah, well they do fight sometimes, um, but they do fight sometimes. Sometimes there are there are murders. Sometimes there are riots. Uh, but what's important to recognize is that they don't fight as much as you might think they would uh, for, uh, I guess, a very simple reason, which is that if there are, are large-scale acts of violence, if there are large-scale uh, disruptions or, or uh, riots, prison officials will lock down a prison. Instead of being able to go out to the yard during the day, officials will put people on what they call modified programming, which means you don't get to leave your cell. And you may not get to leave your cell for weeks or for months or in some cases you know, more than a year. So if you can't ever leave, in addition to not enjoying that, that's a, that's a less enjoyable incarceration experience. But when you're locked down, it's very difficult to make um, money in the underground economy. So large-scale acts of violence undermine the ability for prison gangs to earn money in the underground economy. And that provides an incentive for even though these gangs might like to use violence, is that they have to constrain it. And they constrain it in a few ways. One is they simply find ways to resolve disputes between gangs in a peaceful way. The second is that when violence needs to take place, they do it in a controlled and preferably concealed way. So if two inmates from rival gangs don't like each other, instead of getting into a fight in the yard, which could either prompt a riot or, or a lockdown, is they'll schedule a time for these guys to go into one of their cells and they'll be monitored and they'll get into a fight. They call it a cell fight. And in that way, they use violence, but in a, in a much more controlled fashion. So the desire by prison gangs to make money selling drugs in prison means that they have an incentive to facilitate some level of stability. And even though they may dislike and you know, have a substantial dislike for other gangs, they're going to try to find ways to reduce spontaneous and chaotic acts of violence. But do the leaders of the gangs uh, that overlap within a prison communicate with each other about these kind of issues? Yeah, they, they absolutely communicate with each other. And I mean, as, as in any environment, you might expect that sometimes it's a more or less friendly working relationship with these people. But when conflicts happen, they recognize that it's going to hit them in, in, you know, in the bottom line if there's not a, fine, a way to find a solution to these problems. So they absolutely talk to each other. They often will bring in, um, I, I, you know, outside consultants doesn't, isn't quite the right, the right way to think about it, but they'll contact gang leaders in other prisons or other areas of the prison to ask them to intercede and, and adjudicate some problem that takes place. So they very much recognize that um, it, it's in their interest to uh, avoid kind of serious, chaotic situations. But how do they deal with the market competition of that it would take place, say, out on the streets? You know, this neighborhood might be mine and this neighborhood over mm -hmm. here might be yours. Uh, does it work that way in the um, in the prison? And otherwise, why doesn't price just get bid down very low and the, the profits get dissipated? If they're all competing with each other. Yeah, I, it, that's actually something that we have very little information on. Um, the, a lot of the the research that I've read finds that inmates are allowed to buy and sell drugs from any other inmate, so not just their own gang. And I mean, if that's the case, then it, I think it may be true because it's very difficult, uh, as we've discussed, to watch everybody all of the time. And it might be that it's easy to covertly buy drugs from someone from a different group or not. So even if gang leaders or the people who make the most money uh, would like to prevent it, uh, 
it's too difficult to monitor uh, to prevent it, to segregate uh, sales either geographically or within uh, a certain community of inmates. I suppose the supply is somewhat erratic as well, so you wouldn't always be guaranteed availability if you were stuck with your own with your own gang. Yeah, and I, I think that there there are some people who are um, kind of active consumers of drugs who very much you know that's an important part of their prison experience. Uh, but there's also surely many inmates who aren't actively trying to do those things. So when they affiliate with some group, they're affiliating for that mutual aid and protection more so than as a way to, to make money while incarcerated. So they're just kind of um, on the sideline while the gangs are involved in this, this more active business. And is there corruption? Uh, one of the you, you give the hierarchy of some of these gangs, it's quite elaborate. Uh, they don't uh, they have a constitution. They have got, they have rules, literal rules, not just informal rules. Um, do we have any idea of how well those work? Yeah. Well, so these gangs. I mean, some some gangs have very few formal rules. Um, others have very elaborate structures. You know, one group that I talk about, they have literally a ten-page, single-space typed written constitution, and it tells basically what's the purpose of the group, what are the different positions that will be held. There's appeals processes, there's elections processes, there are checks and balances. So there's very much an, an, a goal or an intention to create rules to make these groups work better. And you know, despite their best efforts, I think it's probably fair to say that very often those constitutions are not as effective as they would like. It's within gangs, there are um, disputes, there are, there's back dealing, there's people who are trying to take advantage of each other despite the fact that they're in the gang. And these constitutions are not effective enough, or maybe the environment's not conducive enough to eliminate all of those things. So what we do see, so we see what we do see is we see lots of attempts to enforce prison gangs' written rules. We see when individual, we have lots of evidence of gang members assaulting other members who have violated their rules. So it's providing some check. It has some teeth in the ability to. Uh, uh, constrain or alter other prison gang members' behaviors. What's difficult, what we don't observe as much, is the situations where people break the rules and there's no punishment for that. That's less likely to come into kind of the historical record or our evidentiary sources. So some of this is just a, um, a question of language, but you called the convict code uh, the norm of certain rules of keeping your head down and not keeping your, you know, paying your debts, et cetera. You call that decentralized in contrast to the gang system. Uh, I tend to save that word decentralized for anything that isn't the power of the state. And yet in some sense, mm. and this is where it's a gray area, and I say that because the gangs emerge, their constitutions emerge, uh, they're, they're planned and, and executed to some extent within each gang. But the whole environment is is in many ways decentralized, and yet you, you argue to some extent – you can clarify now, you argue to some extent that, that in some ways the gangs are like primitive states. They're primitive governments that regulate behavior. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the convict code, nobody came up with the rules. There's not someone designated to enforce the rules. There's not some body to monitor enforcement of those rules. Those are kind of like hallmarks of like very like much more centralized rulemaking. The gangs are, are much more centralized. It's, it's very much about designated power, um, top-down control within a gang. The, the community of prison gangs operates more along a polycentric line, right? There are these competing sources of authority and rulemaking in the prison. In a sense, uh, when we study early states, primitive states, what we see is that these groups come into power um, not because of a social contract, but as a desire to extract resources from communities and their profit seeking. And sometimes that profit seeking creates incentives to formalize their organization, to legitimize their organization. And in a sort of Mainzer Olson stationary bandit style of argument, the desire to profit through taxation may lead early states or prison gangs to provide that order and stability. Describe the stationary versus roving bandit. For people who aren't familiar with it, the roving bandit is, you know, it's a thought experiment of a bandit who he's only going to be, uh, he's only going to be there one day. And there's someone, there's a town, 
And if he's only going to be there one day, he has an incentive to steal everything that they have, everything that's of value. The stationary bandit also wants to you know, maximize wealth, but he's going to be there for the indefinite future. And so he recognizes that if I steal everything that they have of value today and every other day, then they're no longer going to produce anything of value. So the stationary bandit, unlike the roving bandit, has an incentive to reduce how much he steals in the current period so that he can maximize how much he steals over future periods. And one of the ways that he can maximize, at least in the story, the way that he can maximize his total earnings is to not only not steal everything today, but to provide some protection from other bandits, provide some public goods, to provide some governance, to try to make the town more productive so that in the future, the stationary bandit has more to steal from. So it, it's a nice sort of um, invisible hand explanation for how someone who is very much profit-seeking and self-interested could, through this profit incentive, uh, incentive have, a, have an incentive to create something that's good generally for people who live underneath it. So this is kind of a – that's a dark story uh, in a certain yeah. way, and, and in many ways the gang story is a dark story. It's um, – there's, but in the back of your mind, you do have to remember that these are not normal people. They're not a cross section of your friends and family that you might know as the reader. They are uh, highly selected to be violent, mm. uh, as you say, not looking, to, tending not to look to the future. Uh, they're risk takers. Uh, they have a bunch of characteristics, which is why they're there. And you argue, and you've argued in this conversation, you argue in the book that. Gangs in some dimension are good. They're certainly good for prisoners. Uh, so talk about uh, how you think about that. Well, I, I think that um, they're good in, in a limited way. They're good in the sense that given large prison populations and given current levels of formal governance, then prison gangs increase access to contraband and they increase stability and order amongst the inmates. So in, in that sense, gangs, um, they certainly play an important role, and for many inmates, a, a, a beneficial role in increasing access to these things. What's not good about gangs is, is a fairly long list. I mean, the, the first is that in increasing access to contraband, that undermines the, the goals and intentions of prison staff. The lifetime affiliations that these gangs often require their members undermines rehabilitation so that people who leave prison with a gang affiliation are, are likely to come back sooner and more often. And then when we look at this polycentric system of governance, I mean, it, it is very impressive when you look at the characteristics of the individuals involved. These should be the least trustworthy, least cooperative individuals, but they're able to sustain a fairly high level of economic activity. And, and, and that's a, a very interesting, in, in, in a sense, a sort of positive story. Um, but these systems of governance are, have very little accountability, very little equality, very little uh, concern for the rule of law. And they're, they're very much driven by either violence outright or the threat of violence. So the, the system of governance that exists in, in many prisons, in, in particular in California today, um, they, they've, they've accomplished something important, which is that they have increased access to illicit goods and services uh, far more than a, you know, a decentralized or a convict code type of system could do. And, and in that way, I think it provides an important lesson that the type of people in a community doesn't necessarily dictate in a determinate way whether or not they're going to be able to flourish economically. Yeah. Um, uh, there are other lessons uh, I hope we're going to get to, um, or hope we're going to get to as well. But I have to say, I, I feel a little bit like, uh, for Monty Python fans, uh, there's an, a skit where a, um, a person is interviewed talking about the Piranha Brothers and he's very eager, despite the viciousness of the Piranha Brothers, he's very eager to to sing their praises. Uh, and I, as as I got uh, further into your book, I found myself um, more alarmed about what gangs can can do to people who who don't play along. And uh, I, I don't really want to say anything bad about them. <laughs> I, I, so I, I think it's brave of you to. I'm I'm, I'm only half joking, by the way. There is a uh, there's there's a a very depressing and terrifying aspect of the reach of gangs outside of the prison that comes through in the book and on the Absolutely. lives of these people. It's it's incredibly um, 
uh, depressing. And so one of the questions I want to ask you is, have you received any feedback on your book from prisoners or gang members? Uh, not since the book has come out. Um, partly because uh, being in London, I don't have access to the same uh, networks and the same people who served uh, uh, as, as subjects to interview during the process of writing the book. Um, the, the feedback that I got when I was writing the book, though, um, it, it, people in California prisons, this is the least interesting part of their day. So when gangs decide who goes to the cafeteria first or who, who uses the basketball court, these are like the most mundane situations to them, um, but they're fascinating uh, to, to those of us who don't know that experience. Um, so, so in a sense, when, when I've gotten feedback from them, it, it's almost uh, like, why are you writing a boring book? You know, I could tell you some, some interesting stories. <laughs> yeah, um, right. You're looking at the, yeah, what are you interested in these pieces of paper? We write these notes down on. These aren't where the yeah. action is. Yeah, I get well, that. It, it, it's with the presumption that, uh, you know, we use paperwork in every other facet of our life, our churches, our schools, our businesses. So it shouldn't be surprising that, that these inmates uh, kind of bring those things about. And, and maybe I can just say kind of one other point is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad in a sense that you found it disturbing because it, it is really disturbing. And I want to shine a light on the fact that uh, there's a whole world going on in here, and uh, there's a whole lot of people in prisons in California, and look what they have to deal with. And so it, it, to, to, as a social scientist to look at it and say, well, look, um, we didn't think, you know, may, maybe we would have guessed that they wouldn't have been able to overcome all of the problems of, of the incarceration experience, and they've done that, isn't to diminish the fact that nobody thinks that this is an ideal situation. I mean, they're far, far, far from it. So when I read a book like this, I'm an economist, so I go, yeah, this all makes sense, but I suspect your approach is uh, quite controversial among other academics who take a different approach. What are some of those other approaches and what kind of response have you gotten from, from that other part of the academic world? Well, uh, some of the other approaches that they use, so I mean, in, in sociology and criminology, the, the two main approaches to understanding prison life have been uh, along, on the one hand, the importation theory which is uh, basically an argument that to understand life in prison, we have to understand the communities, the culture, and the life outside of prison. And so people will study how values, I guess, translate into uh, the prison setting. A second way that people study prisons is um, by, uh, by understanding the, the deprivation that exists in prison. And they say prisons are very, uh, they're, they're full of the pains of imprisonment. To understand why life in prison looks the way it does, we need to understand, you know, what life in prison is like, why it's so painful to be there. So the, for the first, it, it's very much about uh, a value-driven or culture-driven or – and it's trying to explain in, things that happen in prison by the values that happen on the outside. What I'm trying to do is, is trying to say that you may have values out there, but the way that you're going to respond given those values is very much dependent on what the prison itself looks like. So it's much closer to this pains of imprisonment model. So um, – the research on prisons has looked at how things like um, norm or values of hypermasculinity drive the formation of gangs, for example. There's the idea that when inmates are in prison, they, they value male dominance. There's no females to dominate, so they form gangs to dominate other males. And there's something that may be kind of descriptively useful or accurate about thinking about the issue like that. But that framework doesn't allow us to explain why, for 100 years, men in California prisons didn't form gangs to dominate. So what I'm trying to do is, is kind of um, be able to explain both where the gangs exist and where they don't. And so some of the appeals that uh, other people make to male dominance or just a preference for racism, I think can't provide that uh, explanation of the variation very well. Uh, there's about a half a page, I think, in the book about women. So explain mm -hmm. why, you, you know, it could just be, well, you were interested in male gangs, but that's not the reason. There's so little coverage of women in here, right? There's traditionally much less study of female prisons than male prisons. That may be partly because there are so many more male prisons uh, and prisoners than females. Females are maybe 10% of the male po uh, uh, total prison population. And so what I, what I do very briefly in the book, as you note, is I, I try to understand what's life like, how, what are the governance institutions like in female prisons. 
And in female prisons, they're not at all like the male prisons in California. They're not these organized large groups that have lifetime commitments. They're not racially segregated in the same way. They don't have the paperwork. They're not as violent. Uh, the illicit markets are not as flourishing. And one possible reason for that may be that, you know, w women are more sensible than men uh, or something like that. Um, but which is no is, doubt true, of course. Yeah. Which, is, which is no doubt true. Um, but in addition to that, it, it may also be that women's prisons, the demographics, look very much like the demographics looked in male prisons before gangs formed. So female prisons today are very small. And they're much more stable populations. And we should expect in these small populations that individuals' reputations would be able to permeate. They would provide a check on bad behavior. And what we see is these formation of, of they call them families, so groups of two or three or four women who kind of group together. It's not permanent. It's much more fleeting, not racially segregated. So it doesn't have any of the hallmarks of prison gang activity. And in a sense, that looks a lot like what male prisons look like when they had small prison populations. So it may be that they're more sensible and or it may also be that uh, given the, the small prison populations, this sort of more casual level of governance is as effective as it needs to be. So some people, again, you've painted a picture that's um, – it's descriptive, but there's something both positive and negative about it. Uh, most prison officials, most policymakers – would like to see less gang activity and less uh, illicit uh, commercial activity. What do they do now uh, to reduce the uh, power of gangs in prisons, and what would you suggest they do instead since they're not doing yeah. a very good job? The most common way that they try to control gangs is through su suppression strategies or what I like to think of as supply-side supply strategies which is that they identify who are the most active gang members and they remove these people from the general population and they put them into more isolated, segregated, controlled living areas. And that's failed. Uh, the gangs are still very important and active. And I think it's failed because this isn't a supply side problem. Gangs don't exist because there are angry, violent people who are in prison. Gangs exist because there's inmates generally have a demand for what gangs provide. So in the same way that if we were to remove uh, all of the restaurants uh, today, but allowed restaurants to open tomorrow, because people have a demand for restaurants, you're going to see people coming in to fill that market. So when gang leaders are, are, are taken out of the general populations of prisons, new leaders come, in, come into place uh, very, very quickly. And that's because there are people who want security and order and it's very profitable to provide those things. So that's why I think the suppression or supply side approaches have failed. And in a, in a very, I guess, in a very speculative sense, um, since we haven't, we don't have the experience, people haven't tried enough alternatives, but if we want to speculate, one way that we might try to reduce the influence of gangs is to address that demand side. So if inmates turn to gangs for order and stability, maybe prison officials can provide more order and more stability for them. Crowding yeah. out, crowding out the, the supply of gang protection. Ideally making it so that people don't have a demand for these yeah. things. Um, the, the prison economy itself, as I mentioned, is very restricted. In, I think it was 2005, the state of California uh, prohibited uh, tobacco. I, I think it's a public health concern. And one of the most important sources of illicit profits to gangs now is smuggling in um, tobacco. How right? surprising. So as, we reduce, <laughs> as we reduce the, uh, the formal, uh, acceptable way to gain access to goods, if people demand those things, inmates want those things. Um, maybe to give another example, it's notoriously costly to make a phone call in prison. It costs something like a dollar a minute in California. Not surprisingly, there's now a huge demand for mobile phones amongst inmates. Okay, and uh, in which 2000, are, which, which are against the rules. It, it's totally against the rules to have a cell phone in a California prison. So there aren't any. <laughs> so there aren't. So so the one so the people who bring them in, you know, profit a lot from doing so. In in, in 2011, 15, they confiscated 15,000 cell phones from inmates. 15,000 cell phones. This is a, a huge number of phones. And if 
the, the phones that they're allowed to use weren't so expensive, then maybe there would be less demand for illicit phones. Or if we could find a way technologically to provide them cell phones that limited their access in certain ways but made you know, acceptable uses available, then there'd be less profit opportunities for people that maybe we don't want to have more control of resources. I guess the other question would be um, I wonder what the political incentives are to make prisons better than they actually are. They, you know, they're horrible places. They're terrifying. Uh, people get hurt there. They die there. They don't learn a lot of skills. Um, they're forced through these incentives we're talking about when they leave prison – to be um, – to remain connected to the people still in the prison. Uh, some people would say, well, that's good. You know, these, these are horrible people. They deserve this. So they, they did bad things and the fact that their lives stink while they're in prison is too bad. And uh, we should just let them, let them rot there. And I, I, you can't help but feel while you're reading the, the book that that's not an ideal. Uh, you don't preach about it at all, but, but just as you read these, these stories – uh, people get caught up in the system in a very overpowering and dramatic way. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not good for other people outside the prison when they come back, when the folks out of, come out of the prison and continue to do things that are that are not so healthy, like, say, shoot people in drive-by shootings and yeah. gang wars over no. drugs. Uh, so so there's, there's a big incentive, it seems to me, policy-wise, even though they don't have a big uh, political – Pull to, to try to to try to make this better, and as I was reading your book, I, I thought inevitably of, of the following: let's make let's make tobacco legal, um, give them a, a chance to give themselves cancer if they want, give them that freedom, and uh, if drugs were legal, uh, there wouldn't be as much profit from uh, selling them in prison. Uh, I'm not saying they should be legal. Maybe in well, I guess if they're legal outside, they should be legal inside. They'd be cheap. Um, and, uh, a lot of this would go away. It seems like would most of it, I mean, there'd still be markets for a sexual activity for, I don't know what else would be contraband or stamps, you know, I don't know what else, cell phones, but uh, wouldn't, isn't a huge portion of this driven by the profit of, of dealing drugs? It's it's definitely a part of it. This is something. I mean, this is such a complex issue that I'm very hesitant to kind of, you know, speculate about what would happen, say, if you legalize drugs. One, you know, what we what, what I what I do think is true is that bigger prisons cultivate prison gangs. Um, the drug war contributes about 20 percent to uh, the nation's prison population. 20% is, is a lot, but it, it's still – we'd still yeah, incarcerate probably. far more people than everyone else. So it's not just a drug issue. So if we assumed best-case scenario, legalizing drugs, everyone that was in prison for drug offenses doesn't go there, which, which isn't true, which wouldn't happen. But if we assumed that, we'd still have massively huge prison populations and large enough that I think that inmates would, would still need or want to form gangs. If <laughs> prison officials, I guess, made – uh, heroin, uh, heroin and marijuana available to inmates. Um, well, that's uh, not going to sell. <laughs> it's not going to sell. Yeah, I, I can't, I, Never mind. I'm sorry, I even uh, mentioned uh, it. Actually, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't see that happening. The governor um, of California that proposes that it's a liberal state, but it's probably not that liberal. Um, uh, let, let's talk. Let's close and talk about. Well, just to finish. I interrupted you, but I think one thing you say in the book is, uh, and it might be. Um, Somebody else's suggestion, smaller prisons is not a bad idea. Every dollar that we spend on prisons, we could buy more crime control if we spend on police. So if you're considering the many different ways to reduce the cost of crime in society, one is to make fewer things crime, so reduce, you know, legalize you know, some, some drugs. Another is to, to – there's diminishing returns with prison use. Right? When, you, when you start increasing the size of the prison population – you get the people go to prison are the ones who commit the most crimes the most often. And when they're off the street, the next people who go to prison are the ones who commit some crime fairly often. And as you lock up more people, the frequency of committing criminal offenses by the people entering falls and falls. So when there's diminishing returns to how much crime you're reducing by locking people up, we want to basically recognize that, stop, and when we hit those diminishing returns, 
spend more in areas where there are not as, and where the returns are still um, substantial, still worth it. So, and, and of course, you know, when when I suggested legalizing drugs to reduce the prison population, I didn't just mean because it's not a crime anymore. I meant the the, the violence that is alongside it in competition mm-hmm. for those profits, which is not through advertising or the traditional ways that commercial interests compete is has these terrible spillovers of innocent people being killed and it just uh, and the resource is just so depressing. Yeah, the, in Los Angeles, drug dealers are sending 20 to 30 percent of their drug profits to prison gang members, and those gangs would be less powerful. They'd have less influence if they didn't have access to those things. Um. So let's close by talking about some of the bigger picture implications. We spent the whole time talking about uh, prisons, which are which are fascinating. But I think your book has a lot of implications for activities outside of prison. And, and in your last chapter, you, you talk about that a little bit. I'm going to read a quote uh, from the book, and, and I, want you, I would like you to expand on it. And I have to say, uh, before we leave it behind, that you know, all of these things we're talking about also remind me of Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments of how mm-hmm. people use approval and disapproval to learn what the norms are. And Smith was talking about being a, a gentleman in his day. Um, and this uh, – your book is about how to behave like a good convict, uh, which yeah. is a very different uh, different uh, phenomenon but has many of the same characteristics. You're not sure when you walk into that environment what the rules are. You're trying to figure them out and you learn them. Sometimes by somebody just telling you, like, don't eat with your mouth full, uh, don't talk with, excuse me, don't talk with your mouth full, or you need to say thank you. But in the case of the of the prison environments, it's a different set of of rules and behaviors. But I, so I want to make that generalization. But there's another deeper related point that you close say near the end. You say first to understand aggregate economic and social outcomes, we must understand the extent to which people rely on extra legal governance. We would know little about the prison economy or social order if we only studied approved items purchased in the prison commissary or only formal mechanisms of social control. Likewise, to study only the local stock market or national government would ignore much of the economic and political processes in operation, especially in those countries that have the weakest formal institutions. Uh, talk about what you what you mean to say there and uh, its implications. Well, I mean, half of the world's workers are in the informal economy. They're they're not registered, regulated, or taxed. Half of the world's workers who do you know trillions of dollars of business. If we're not measuring them, how do we how are we going to understand economic activity in a country if we ignore those people? Um, it, it, I guess in the same way, you know, talking about the importance of things like etiquette. Um, Throughout your day, I mean, it's not just that there are, you know, rules in your business or, or, or government rules that guide your um, behaviors. If, if we don't fully account for all of these informal institutions and all of these activities taking place that aren't captured in formal numbers, then we don't only have an imperfect picture of society, but a biased one. And so I think it's crucial that we, I guess, as social scientists, uh, recognize that and, and, and work more to make that less hidden. I think the other the other thought I had while thinking about that is that there's a crucial interaction between formal and informal mechanisms. Mm. So there there are these rules that are enforced by the state through the sanctioned use of violence, and there's mm. rules there are rules enforced by the the gang. They're they're sanctioned within the prison community. They're not sanctioned by the prison itself, of course. Or maybe we could argue that they were that they are because the prison. In theory, could add more guards, add more surveillance cameras, as you mentioned in the book, and reduce this activity. But it's there's a certain symbiotic—I don't know what what you want to call it—there's uh, a certain emergent order that between these two uh, forms of governance. And it seems to me that unless you think about that, unless you think about, for example, how property rights uh, interact with trust uh, in, say, America versus a different country where the rules of trust are different and the property rights are different. It seems to me that when you only look at the formalized governance structure, you are – it's not just, oh, I missed that part of the economy where people are, say, using barter or uh, dealing in cash because they want to avoid taxes or the the, the reach of the government's not not everywhere. But it's really, uh, I think, equally important, maybe more important 
that how people behave in a world where they're facing two types of governance systems is where the action is. And to some extent, we're always facing legal and for I would call it formal and non-formal uh, forms of, of regulation and, uh, and rules. The rules that people respond to aren't just the ones that the government gives and or, or formal bodies. And if they put rules on an underlying community that are inconsistent with the underlying rules, then the consequences that they seek aren't going to be the ones that are realized. So to understand policies and institutions, we need to understand, like you note, those underlying ideas about trust, about values, about what they expect from other people, what's uh, you know uh, uh, acceptable behavior by other people. And if we don't understand those underlying, those deeper informal or non-formal factors, then when we apply the formal rules that we think we got just right, they may lead us uh, to disaster uh, instead of to desirable outcomes. My guest today has been David Scarbeck. Uh, his book, uh, which I highly recommend and which, by the way, is short but uh, full of uh, – crammed with insight is The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System. David, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.